Hi, my name is Ken, and this is Let's Code a MUD in C++11 Part 6. Uh, in Part 5, we uh, created this write interface so that uh, the program, uh, other parts of the program can uh, write data out uh, to our Telnet clients uh, over our socket interface uh, using a standard string interface here. Uh, and today, using function templating, uh, we're gonna we're gonna spiffy this up a bit. We're gonna make this usable uh, a little more user friendly, a little more efficiently, uh, and we'll see what that looks like in a second. So, uh, function templating is a concept in C plus plus ninety eight uh, that's that's been around since the beginning of the language, uh, and it relies a little bit on a related concept of uh, overloading, function overloading. Uh, and we talked about that a little bit in part three in R values, where we had. Um, some foo of int and a foo of float. And they are different functions that happen to have the same name. And they have completely different implementations under the hood. And the compiler just picks which one based on the argument. So if I called foo of 4, it's going to call a foo of int. And if I call foo of 4.0, it's going to call foo of float. Um, and this gives us a mechanism to provide uh, different functions that might have the same meaning, the same semantic, um, you know, uh, uh, logical meaning, uh, but have a different implementation uh, because of the the specific type that's used. Um, so let's let's make this a little more concrete. Let's talk about uh, a get square function. Uh, so get square of int. Uh, what what's what does it take to get the square of a number? What does that mean? It means to return the the number times itself. Um, and then if we did the same thing for uh, the float implementation, let's call this get square. Um, it's it's really the same function, honestly. Uh, it's it's only different in in the types involved. Um, and and the way this works under the hood is that it's this value times value, the, this multiplication operation, really it has uh, two, two definitions. It has one that's defined for ints, it has int times an int, and it has float times a float, and the compiler knows which one you're referring to uh, based on the, the type of the objects. And in C++, you could even make your own class, say a class representing complex numbers, uh, and say, and overload the uh, the multiplication operator for complex times complex or complex times int or something like that. Um, anyway, um, so this this is what you would do to create two different functions uh, that have the same meaning, the same logical uh, meaning, uh, but operate on different types. And so that's that's function overloading. Um, now, where we get to function templating is noticing that these these templates actually, or these, these functions actually have the same body to them. They have the same algorithm. It's the same set of steps you want to do. It's just the specific definition of what these steps mean is dependent on the types. Um, so templates sort of give us a way to create one algorithm uh, that we then specialize, uh, we create uh, instances of uh, on demand uh, for, for any given type. So let's look at what get square. Uh, T value and this would be float value. Uh, so get square a value would just be return value times value. And for this algorithm to work, obviously um, this multiplication operator would need to be defined uh, for whatever class uh, T, whatever type uh, gets piped into this get square uh, template. Uh, so you can see already that um, for for templating for function templating to be able to work in C++ uh, operator overloading the ability uh, to be able to provide new meanings uh, for the multiplication operator or, or for any other operator that's that's actually going to be essential uh, if we're going to have a language uh, with templates the way C++ does that language has to have operator overloading it can't just have function overloading um, so other languages like Java or whatever might not have operator overloading. They might see it as a bit of a gimmick. Say if you want if you want that kind of customizable, uh, unpredictable implementation, then then just use a function. That's not going to cut it in C So anyway, um, we have this template that basically we can we don't need these anymore because we have the template. Uh, what happens if I call you know get square four or get square uh, 4.0. Um, so what this is really doing is this is really telling the compiler that, hey, I want get square of int. 
uh, and go ahead and specialize that. Go ahead and make a get square where t is int. And then here at this call site, we're going to call it with four. Um, so this it, using a templated function causes the compiler to ensure that it exists. Uh, and because of that, this, this has to be in a header file. This has to be in an HPP file so that any consumer of, of the templated function has the full information it, it needs to be able to create its version of, you know, get square of int or get square of float or get square of, of complex, uh, wh whatever. Uh, and that's that's actually kind of neat already is you can see that um, I could have some uh, get square of complex without even this when when this get square algorithm was created this this template function I, I didn't even need to know that complex existed I just needed I needed to know that in order to get a square you multiply something by itself and as long as multiplication is well defined then get square is well defined for any future class that might come along um, so uh, we don't type this. We don't we don't type the the angle brackets um, because the compiler is, is perfectly fine at, at deducing uh, what type we mean. When I say get square four, four is an int. So the compiler is going to go ahead and plug int into t because because it's part of an argument. Now there is the one case if it weren't part of an argument, if this was like some get random number or something like that, uh, that that would be the case where we would have to specify the type ourselves. Um, but because all the types in the template are types that are deducible in the argument list, um, we don't have to tell it anything. We just give it the argument and let the compiler decide uh, what, what the best type is. Um, so we have get square of an int, get square of a float. What, what does this look like? This actually looks a lot like um, our overloads. This looks like what happened when we had foo of int, foo of float, uh, rather than doing, doing it with a template. Um, and and that's that's exactly right because what's this template doing? Is this this template is creating overloads uh, basically on demand? This template is saying I am giving the compiler instructions for how to make this function, and then the compiler can make fifty different versions of this function. It can have get square of int, get square of float, get square of complex, get square of whatever, uh, and these are all distinct functions uh, with the get square name. These are all overloads. So function templates are instructions to the compiler, a, a formula or a, a template, if you will, of, of steps to create an overload. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's really nifty because it's, there's sort of a, a, a circle at play here. There's the template itself relies on this multiplication overload existing um, for your given type. But then what the template's doing the overload is feeding into the template and the template itself is actually creating a new overload. So I, I could have another algorithm, uh, some, some other templated, uh, you know, T get square and print it. Um, and that could rely on get square because now those overloads of get square will exist, uh, for any time I attempt to use them. So, so that, that circle, that, that, that cycle of overloads feeding into templates, which then create new overloads, that that allows us to really create a, a rich ecosystem of of functions on demand uh, for types we haven't even heard of yet, and and that gives us things like the standard template library, like all, all the containers in C plus um, plus, that they're all basically done on the principle of having some templated algorithm for how to do inserts, for how to do deletes. Uh, for a particular data structure, whether that's the vector or the, the doubly linked list uh, or a double ended queue or a set or a tree or whatever, um, it, th that algorithm is type agnostic. And then as, as the type comes in, as we know the type, um, we, we go ahead and fill out that class, fill out what all those algorithms actually specialize to. Um, so anyway, I, I find this concept really... Um, cool uh honestly <laughs> i know that's kind of geeky to say but i find it cool and i find it to be i find it to really be maybe the most important part of c plus plus it, it's really it's something that makes this language stand out from other languages other languages would solve this problem in a different way other languages would say uh if you want a, a to be able to call a function with some any any old class then it has to implement an interface or it has to implement a trait or something like that. And it would add a level of indirection. Templating doesn't add a level of indirection. Templating actually goes out and creates a new function. So anyway, soapbox over.
let's um, let's talk about what this means for our program. So um, what I'm getting at here is is the right the right uh, method here, which is that I don't necessarily want to call it with a standard string, but I actually want to send it anything that's printable. So anything that implements the uh, the less than less than operator, the the stream insertion operator as it's called, anything that you could write to an O stream, I want to be able to write to this connection. Um, and this is this is how you would do it. Now you can see I'm I'm using const reference here. I'm not using a value. That means this will work better uh, for classes that that don't want to be copied or can't be copied. Uh, it also works for value types. It'll work for ints. It just it's going to add a very very tiny layer of indirection where it's going to take the reference to the int instead of the int itself, and that's acceptable. We need to support both. Then go ahead and use const reference. Um, so anyway. We're doing that. We're taking in a, a some object that's printable, and we're printing it. And then we're calling the the underlying write to socket. Um, which, by the way, I like this this pattern. This this uh, doing the the type specific bit in the HPP file, and then doing the type agnostic bit in the CPP file. I think that really helps encapsulation. It helps uh, uh, avoid. Uh, putting all your implementation details out there, just putting the things that are specific to what the user might do, that what the user might provide, putting that in the HPP file. So I, I like that pattern. I, I use that a lot. Um, let's also make um, let's make a stream interface because a person might not want to call you know write hi write my write name you know whatever. Um, they they might want to just say hi my name is Joe as if this were an O stream. Uh, we could create a conversion operator for an O stream, but let's let's avoid that uh, first. Let's let's just do let's do like a write, but uh, just implement the the stream insertion operator, the the less than less than. So as if this were an O stream, it it will it will accept being on the left side of this operator and take in something, some some const message, right? And so that means this has to be a template again. Uh, so what's this doing? This is this is making it so that someone could say, you know, connection. Hi, my name is uh, Joe, or or whatever. Uh, it's it's adding that that binary operator, the the less than less than the stream insertion operator. Um, so how would we implement this? Well, we have a message. We know how to write a message. We just do it, um, and then we have an O stream. So let's return it. Uh, unfortunately, this this doesn't exactly work. Uh, this does call write to socket, so the message will get written out. The problem is what happens afterwards. What happens with all the stuff that the the user the the rest of the program puts into the output stream uh, when when the async handler uh, returns for write to socket, it's not going to know that there's more stuff waiting for it uh, because we didn't call write again. We didn't call write to socket again. Uh, so this is what I want to do. But I actually can't do this either because <laughs> this is after the return line, and that's that's obviously not going to work. I've got anything I'm going to do. I've got to do it before the uh, the person calling this gets their hands on the the output stream. So uh, what I'm going to do to make this work is I'm just going to set more to write to be true uh, because I I know that write to socket is already being called. I know there's going to be an async handler at some point. So I'm just saying that whenever that async handler completes there's probably going to be more to write. Now, they might not use it that way. They might use it, uh, they just might say, hi, my name is, and not say Joe. In which case, okay, we have one wasted call. I can live with that. Um, so there's one more case that we haven't accounted for yet, uh, which is what happens if I want to give this to another function as an O stream? I don't necessarily have a message I want to put in at all. I, I could just you know, do connection less than less than and then uh, empty quotes, uh, but that's that's a really cumbersome way of doing it. Let's create a function that returns an O stream. So we'll call it O stream. Uh, this could be also a, a conversion operator, an implicit conversion operator. I don't really like doing that. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure there's an async call queued, and we're going to set more to write to be true. This is exactly like the previous case. And then we're going to go ahead and return M output stream. See, this is exactly the same, except we don't have that initial message to put in. Um, all right. So this is the interface that uh, this is done at this point. This is the interface that the the rest of the program is going to have to be able to use the the connection class uh, to be able to put things out to the connection class. Uh, in the next part, we're going to talk about the input side. Uh, but until then, um, my name is Ken, and 
This was Let's Code, Mud, and C++ 11, Part 6.